be here. I, um, this is my first Ocean Atmospheric Conference, so it's thrilling and a little intimidating. But I would like to take you now up to the other side of the country, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this is the eastern edge of the San Juan Archipelago, where there is an eelgrass meadow. Um, in this presentation, I want to tell you a little bit about the research that we're doing at the Badilla Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve on eelgrass and um, the exploration that we're doing with geostatistical tools and ESRI's um, ArcGIS and ArcGIS Pro to interpolate or krieg those plot locations to landscape scale. So Padilla Bay is located between Washington, Vancouver, British Columbia, and Seattle, Washington, and it hosts the largest eelgrass meadow in the lower 48. Eelgrass is critical habitat for many species, especially salmon making their migration from the fresh to saline waters, to the nursery habitat for herring and forage fish. Uh, the herring lay their eggs on the eelgrass. Um, many commercially important fisheries like Dungeness crab have many life stages in the eelgrass meadow. And it's also critical habitat for birds. For, for example, the black brant making its migration from the Arctic to Mexico eats only eelgrass and solely dependent on these large eelgrass meadows. So Padilla Bay is one of 30 national estuarine research reserves located around the country, including Puerto Rico and, and Hawaii, uh, where we've established a long-term standardized water quality monitoring program. We monitor temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and water level, as well as, well as nutrients, um, weather data, and then Many of the reserves are doing biomonitoring in their salt marsh beds at Padilla Bay because of our extensive eelgrass. We have 8,000 acres of it. We do our monitoring in the eelgrass. Um, these are my colleagues and co-authors. That's Jude, Nicole, and Heath doing a dive survey on the subtitle plots. So each summer since 2011, we have gone out during peak biomass, June or July, to monitor percent cover, density, biomass, and height along three four-kilometer transects. So there's 126 plots, uh, and we've posted the data from 2011 to 2015, anyway, on to our story map. Uh, so Padilla Bay, this is an oblique photo of Padilla Bay, standing at the shore, looking west towards the San Juan Islands. You can see it's a mosaic of deep water channels, vegetation, and bear. And on extreme low tides of minus two and a half feet, this allows us to image the bay and produce distribution uh, maps of dominant species. I say dominant species because we have two species of eelgrass. The dark green, Zost marina, grows from the... Uh, subtitle to the mid to upper intertidal, that's our native species. And then Zoster japonica grows intermixed in the mid intertidal area all the way up to the shoreline. It is an introduced species. It came in the 1930s with the import of Japanese oyster. And it can tolerate extreme temperatures, and that's why it's growing in the upper intertidal area. It can, it can survive up to 20 degrees Celsius unharmed, whereas our native species prefers temperatures below 5 degrees Celsius. So, of all the parameters that we're monitoring, I'm going to focus on density. Density is complicated because it's, it's very heterogeneous and it can be patchy. So this is a view of a plot. It's two meters by half meter, and in this case, it's got a full cover of, um, of density. Whereas, often, you'll find that we'll have very sparse coverage until like one end of our plot, which has got a very dense patch. So, to measure this, we do replicates, um, either uh, five 10 by 10 centimeter quadrats randomly placed or three 25 by 25 centimeter um, quadrats. And that's determined at the time uh, when we survey the plot um, based on how, how dense it looks. So this is the results from 2011 to 2015. This is the time when I did an original um, interpolation of our data, and so that's why it's kind of split up like this. Um, but 
to the, the key point in this plot is the japonica. You can see we had an over 100% increase in mean density between those years. So when we think about that, we're wondering where is that change occurring? Is it all intensity in the location where the japonica is normally found, or is it expanding in its distribution? And then I turn to the geostatistical tools. I'm not a geostatistician, and um, I'm exploring the, uh, the capabilities. So we, at that time, we were using ArcMac 10.3, and we pulled out the empirical Bayesian Krieging because it's, it's said to be robust for the assumptions that usually are, need to be met when Krieging data, and that is seasonality, uh, variability, and as you saw with our density data on the Japonica, it's extremely variable. But I ran it, and uh, using only the plots where we had actually measured some kind of height of Japonica, so sometimes you could go out there and your random plots don't actually land on any Japonica at all, and it'll show zero density. But if you're measuring heights, you look for any Japonica at all. These are the plots that you can see in the points. Um, on the far right-hand side is the shoreline, so you're going from shore to mean low or low water on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, I've added a couple of the channels that come in in the middle of the plot. And then here, uh, <clears throat> it's difficult not to be able to point to it, but you can see that there are some gold boxes across the plot. Um, those are zones. So when we laid out our biomonitor transect, we targeted these zones using aerial photography. Um, the zone one is primarily bare. It gets a little bit of a japonica, but not usually 100% cover. The next zone is is dominant japonica. And then zone three and four are a mix of japonica and marina, but the japonica is dominant in, in the near shore and marina is dominant in farther offshore. And then the last zone, we don't often find japonica at all. That's, that's deeper and tends to be mostly the native species. But that would be the area that we're most interested in predicting if that japonica is expanding into that territory. Um, so here I've added the 2016 through 2017 uh, mean densities, and you can see that they've come back down again. And this is probably explained by an anomalous phenomenon anomaly you may have heard of called the blob. It was a body of warm water that moved up along the west coast of the United States and into the Puget Sound and between the years of 2013 and 2016. So again, the japonica is very tolerant of those higher temperatures, and our native species is not. Since that time, the temperatures have come back down, and we've seen that in the data. So now I'm using ArcGIS Pro, or learning ArcGIS Pro, and uh, I've explored the empirical Bayesian Krieging 3D, which will take into consideration the elevation at each one of those plots, um, as well as this empirical Bayesian Krieging regression. So the regression allows me to bring in a LiDAR raster layer on which to reg regress the data so you can get a better estimate of what the value is. Um, Empirical Bayesian Krieging uses these semi-variograms. Then the blue on the far left is, is a, a, a model of the data for every point in your data set, um, given all the distances in between them, instead of a, an ordinary Krieging where we just have one mean and a variance, and that's what helps to make it more robust. I set the number of simulations to its maximum amount because of the error in our data. Um, I log transform the data because I want my surface plot to have only positive values. And then reading the Esri uh, literature, k Bessel has seemed to be the most um, powerful uh, semi-variogram semi type and um, just more computationally intensive. So this is the result. Um, it shows a lot more distribution than it did in 2015 because of the LIDAR addition. Um, and, and the really interesting thing that I found um, is in 2018, the loss of our density in that upper intertidal area it seems to be really focused in that large, those first two zones from shoreline out. Um, here I've overlaid the plot data. It's very busy, but it gives you an idea. They've been color-coded according to their densities, grouped by 1,200 stems um, per meter square. And uh, you'll see that the lowest densities are all 0 0.001, not zero, and that's because I had to add a constant in order to be able to transform the data. And that may be something I'll want to tweak to have to work around. 
Uh, and then you can see that the intensities have not declined in the last few years, but um, apparently the distribution has. So here they are side by side, just to give you a visual of how those two different tools create the data. So um, in the final results, you get a cross-validation table in order to get an assessment of how well your models fit the data. And this is a plot of the measured to the predicted values. If we're getting pretty positive slope and intriguing, you very often are underestimating the low values and overestimating the high values, and that's what this plot is telling us is happening with our data. Um, the root mean square area, er, square error, if it is equal to one, uh, indicates a fairly um, accurate model. Ours was 0.96. Uh, so we think that it's, it's a good fit, but um, it may be underestimating the error because the root mean square is lower than the average standard error. So, um, so a couple of other diagnostics are that we had 89% of our points in the 90% interval. Um, whereas, and 92% and in the 95% interval. And so you want those to be close to 95% of your points in the 95% interval. So uh, we're close, but it's not ideal. And finally, it's a score that I don't completely understand, continuous ranked probability score for all the points. Um, it said you want to have that low. And I really don't, you know, it's, I don't think 700, uh, 379 is very low. I'm uh, concerned that that might indicate that our models aren't working so well for our data. And this is what the validation diagnostics look like all together. So, ideally, what I'd like to do is consult with a geostatistical analyst and hopefully maybe some of you who have been using this tool. Um, but if it's, if it's a feasible approach to interpolating a surface or creating a surface, um, then I would like to add some more explanatory variables such as inundation. So we have elevations at each one of our plots and we have our water level data so we get an idea of how much exposure those points are having. Um, and the other thing I'd like to do is apply it to our native eelgrass and to our salt marsh data because they um, meet the assumptions of stationarity much better, that they're not as seasonal, there's not as much variability um, and um, they're easier to work with. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.